Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Solace, and with me, as always, is my very, very talented friend who will no doubt go down in history as a rule breaker as well as a rule maker. She is a mixture, Stacey Gina. <laughs> <laughs> I was not ready for what you were going to say. I was like, oh my God. Are you ever? <laughs> Sometimes I can like kind of like think maybe I'm on the right path. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> that could have gone really south. But yeah. thank you. Wow. I, it's, so it's the celebrate. We're in the celebration of Women's Month. Uh, yes, and, my favorite month. Yes, and it's also International Women's Day, um, which just passed, which was on March eighth. Um, so I was hoping that we could all I don't know maybe inspire our listeners to embrace their inner rule breaker. And not fear being a rule maker. You know, be a little more like you. And another legend from the behind the bar, Ada Cooley Coleman. So for those of you who don't know, Ada was a trailblazing pioneer. She broke through gender barriers, all kinds of things to become one of the world's most famous bartenders at the time when uh, female bartenders were extremely rare, extremely rare. I'm... Well, 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 not known, but they weren't rare. Yes. They were not known because they had a vagina. <laughs> and we have a vagina, we can't talk about you. <laughs> but go on. So during her time at the American Bar at the Savoy in London in the early 1900s, um, she made the bar world famous. She delighted every patron and celebrities of her day with her hospitality and inc incredible drinks, of course. Um, she was known to be the life of the party, just like you, Gina. Um, and she counted Mark Twain, Charlie Chaplin, Marlene Dietrich, and even the Prince of Wales amongst her patrons. That Charles has been alive a long time. He has, but he was around <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> he got around, if you will. Um, so... And it's funny is I think you had actually introduced me to this drink. Ada's most famous cocktail it was the hanky panky. It's delicious. Yes, and I think it's one of your menus that actually introduced me to that cocktail. Well, uh, yeah, and, so, and Hank's Oyster Bar forever. Yes, that's yeah, exactly. It is still on the menu. <laughs> um, so um, after more than a century, um, it's still known as uh, one of the top fifty best selling classic cocktails in the world. Isn't that cool? I mean, if it's good, then it never dies, you yeah, know? Apparently. And of course a woman made it, because that's what makes it better. <laughs> Obviously. So uh, she retired in 1926, and to your point, to this date, remains one of the most famous or most celebrated bartenders in the history of the craft. Which is the best. But you know what's really crazy? What's that? There's no cocktail book for her. And if there is, and I'm wrong, and then, and then if our next... Well, let's introduce our dozen name drink and then we'll ask her because all the men have a cocktail book and like most of the women don't they don't have one. Oh, maybe we should do that for her. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe. So even though Ada Coleman began her trailblazing over a century ago, to your point, people still have misconceptions about women and cocktails. But between you, Gina, and today's designated drinker, um, you're about to change all this. So let's introduce her, shall we? She's the managing director of Bourbon Women, a group passionately dedicated to bourbon culture. Please welcome Heather Wibbles to the show. Oh, thank you so much. I'm just, I'm so pleased to be here and talk cocktails and bourbon with you all. Great. So let's just start off the show right, will, shall we? And give our listeners just a little bit about Bourbon Women. Well, sure. Bourbon Women is a national organization that's really dedicated to educating women about bourbon and bourbon culture, curating really fun experiences. And honestly, a lot of it has to do the, with the magic that happens when you're sipping whiskey in a room full of women. There's really nothing like it. Um, a lot of what we do um, is have events in person. Obviously, during the pandemic, we switched to doing a lot of virtual events, which we still continue to this day. And our membership grew about 25 Thirty percent over the couple of years wow. of the pandemic, which we were shocked when we looked at the numbers, but it kind of made sense because there's a real hunger for bourbon education among women, and um, you know it started in Kentucky. We're we'll be twelve years old this year as an organization, so that's sort of a thumbnail about uh, what bourbon women is. That's awesome. So it, I guess you know, I mean, now that we're on the back, the flip side, or well, hopefully the flip side of COVID. 
it does make sense why people would get more interested and find smaller groups like like yours or even just have the time or maybe even the moment of reflection to go, you know, I've really been wanting to do this and stop putting it off and really jumped into a space that they got to start to meet interesting people and talk about things that they and learn something that they were passionate about. Exactly. And one of the things that I find so interesting is that the types of whiskeys that women enjoy most are the ones that are higher proof, they're more robust and more complex. Um, because oh, I think there's the idea sometimes that women want the lighter whiskeys or they want a bourbon that's, yeah. you know, 80 proof. And when I'm with my fellow bourbon women, we're often sipping, you know, low end, 100 proof, high end cast strength pretty regularly. So it's it's kind of fun to educate, I guess, the public about that kind of information, because I think there's a there's a maybe a misconception about the kinds of things that women enjoy in bourbon. And part of it is just we have larger olfactory bulbs than men. And so we have the capacity really to detect and um, identify different scents and flavors and aromas in a way that um, is just because of our biological difference from men. Oh, that's interesting. That's really cool. Well, you know, we also see more color than men. I and, did not know a, that. A, We're just a, better. <laughs> it's a higher spectrum. I mean, we actually see more color. So it's funny is when Dave wants to argue with color with me, I'm like, dude, first off, I'm art director too. You can't even see half the colors I see. So shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I do love what you just said about the women liking the higher proof spirits. When you have 80 proof spirits and there's water added to it to bring it to 80 proof, you lose a lot of floral notes. And people believe that when you put water in, in spirits, you get lots of, it opens up. They call it opening it up. Yeah. Well, a lot of times you miss like where you'll have like those really peaked floral notes, especially in certain things like um, whiskeys, bourbons, even some gins, right? It's when you want it to be like 90, 100, 101 that those spirits start to peak. And I love cash strength, but like that's not for everybody. But I do feel like that's like where you begin to actually taste like all the things that women um, are like susceptible to in their palates. Like you're more prone for spice, sweetness, and uh, different flavors. That's why when you drink a bourbon, you might be like, oh, it's kind of sweet. And then like a male would say to you or, you know, they'll be like, why do you keep saying it's sweet? Because it, it, for you, you're tasting something different. It's like a more of the flavor. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing, your palate. It's interesting in general for tasting, but like I love that you brought that up because it's one of my favorite facts about um, the differences of uh, men and women. I always bring it up when I do like a spirits tasting, you know, like how you taste things and what you might be tasting and striking against. One of the things that I find really interesting is that when you have something in a higher proof, you can make it your own by adding water to it. But if it's already 80 proof, you can't really add a lot and get any extra flavors or aromas out of it. But the flexibility that you have with a spirit that's 100 or cask proof, you really can decide, do I want to sip it neat first? Do I want to then add some water and see what else? So you have a sip that changes based on whether or not you put water in it. Maybe you add some ice and see what happens. So I think another reason that it's um, important to me and to a lot of bourbon drinkers who love higher proof spirits, you can really dial into flavors by how much water or ice you add when you actually sip your bourbon. But now, as a distiller, you make your most money on the 70 proof spirits. <laughs> you're yeah. adding 30% of water. You're like, look how many buckets of water I dumped into this. <laughs> but you can't call it a whiskey <laughs> unless it's got at least 80 proof. <laughs> it's not a bourbon unless it's 80 proof. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. Very jealous where you live. And if you haven't ever been to Kentucky um, and you, if you've ever like went on a wine, you've been to wineries, right? Sure, yes. And you like drive down in California and you're like, oh, here's this one. And there's, you know, I don't know, all the different wineries you can name off the top of your head. And you're driving down the road. When you get to Kentucky, well, when you get to Louisville and Bardstown and all these places, right? Or you're approaching, all of a sudden you start seeing your liquor shelf wide open, right? All of a sudden you start seeing all the names, Maker's Mark, Loretta, this way, blah, blah, and all, and like, 
I felt like a kid in a, can- like a candy store. I was like, I love that bourbon. So let's make a right. It's 13 miles down the road. I mean, I I didn't even know what to do. And like, I have been to distilleries and stuff like that, but like, I didn't really understand the scope of how wonderful Kentucky is, right? Yeah. And like, how cool it is to go and the water sources and all of those things. And like, and I just met Heather right now, folks. So just let's, let's just back up here, right? Yeah. I'm ready to like go on a tour with her instead because I had fun on my own. Oh, we have fun on tours. But I feel like I definitely could learn a thousand things or two from you because that was incredible. Well, one of the things that is really fun for me is bourbon women started in Kentucky and Louisville. There were a couple of women, Peggy No Stevens, who's our founder, was in a meeting with another woman and they were uh, talking about afterwards the fact that nobody was talking about women and what women liked in whiskey. And they knew because in Kentucky, women have always sipped whiskey. It's not something that's been trendy. It's what our mothers and our grandmothers sipped. I mean, my grandfather liked my grandmother because of the way she sipped her whiskey. And I said, how did she sip it? Well, she sipped it neat. So, you know, we have those kind of stories in our families, but what they found was women weren't part of the conversation of whiskey. And so what I like to say is we're bringing women to bourbon and bourbon to women, because not only are we talking about educating women about bourbon, but also just quite frankly, getting more women into the bourbon industry. I think there is a plethora of women who are at points in their careers where Maybe they don't want to run the distillery, but maybe they want to be the director of communications. Maybe they want to be BCOO. I mean, there's all kinds of skilled women out there who love bourbon who maybe just need a little bit of education. And we kind of up the numbers in the whiskey industry because it is it has gotten much better over the last 10 years, first of all. But, you know, part of our passion isn't just getting women to like bourbon and women to talk about bourbon, but also getting brands to recognize women as a market and getting women excited about being in the industry. At the distilleries, 100%, you could see what's tailored towards the women there and what's not. A lot is not the smaller ones, but like the bigger ones. They have like all those gift shops now. And you can tell it's like, you know, women women sip bourbon. You know, like you see like those cute little shirts and stuff like that. So I wonder if, you know, they're hearing you. You know what I mean? Like at... um. Even Heaven Hill had like a like a little bit of that kind of stuff, like real women drink bourbon. I don't know what it said. It said real women drink whiskey or real women did something. Yeah. Right. But it didn't say real women vacuum. So that was great. <laughs> so I was like super, I, I was super pumped about that because I was like, that's some bullshit. So how do you join? How do you get to you? How do we do this? Well, so, so you can find all about bourbon women at uh, bourbonwomen.org, right? And there's a big button in the middle that says, join us. Um, and we really have, we have 16 branches across the country. We have them on coast to coast. Um, and we have local events at all those areas. And really what we hear over and over again, like I went to the St. Louis Bourbon Festival and met with a bunch of women in the branch there. And what we hear over and over again from women, not just in Kentucky, but across the country is that they're, they're so excited to sip whiskey in a room full of women who understand the insanity that is loving bourbon. They understand that, you know, nobody's going to look at scants if you have 30, 50, 100 whiskey bottles, because we understand what it's like to taste a new bourbon or whiskey and think, I've got to have that, even though, I mean, if you can't see it, but I've got like 50 or 60 open bottles behind me, but I don't have that one. So I want to get that one. And it's sort of like finding your people. It's like finding your tribe. So a lot of what we're doing is kind of expanding for me personally let me back up for me personally it's important that people who are whiskey drinkers who drink whiskey and cocktails and bourbon and cocktails feel comfortable to call themselves whiskey drinkers because when i say the words whiskey drinker how do you think i'm drinking my whiskey probably neat yeah but if i say i'm a gin drinker how do you think i drink my gin like me with soda. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Long, for sure. Long, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right? So you're thinking, oh, she drinks martinis or she drinks gin and tonics or maybe she likes skimlets. So a lot of what I do personally when I'm talking with people about being whiskey, you know, whiskey education, cocktail education about bourbon, I'm really trying to expand the definition of what a whiskey drinker is because I think there's a huge, huge volume of people who love bourbon and whiskey and cocktails 
but feel like they can't call themselves whiskey drinkers when in fact they are in the same way that a gin drinker loves martinis. If I only want old fashions in Manhattans, can I call myself a whiskey drinker, a bourbon drinker? I think so. Yeah. I, yes. Yes. Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. So Heather, tell us how did your journey start? Um, how did you end up as the managing director um, of this organization? And what does that, re- what does that role entail? Um, it started with uh, me moving back to Kentucky. I lived in Nashville, Tennessee for 17 years. I moved back to Kentucky and decided that bourbon was a, a, it's a huge part of the economy and of the culture here. And I thought, well, I should probably know a little bit about bourbon. So my best friend and I started going to the distilleries. And this was early on in the bourbon trail where I think we only had to go to six or seven distilleries to get our entire bourbon trail stamp. I think now they're like a 13 or 14 or 15. It's ridiculous. Um, And we heard about an event at the Filson Club, which is a historical society in Louisville with Fred Minnick, who's a huge whiskey writer. And it was a book called Whiskey Women. And we went to the event and we were greeted with cocktails by a woman named Joy Perini, who is one of the, the top cocktail people she's since passed. But she really started the revival of bourbon cocktails, especially in Kentucky and Louisville. And we went upstairs and heard Jimmy and Jaretta Russell, who, of course, are of wild turkey fame, uh, speaking about all of this. And then Fred Minnick talked about Jimmy his... Russell is so cute. He is. He's, he, He's he so is cute. wonderful. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, and we fell in love with the organization, and we never really stopped going to events. I was showing up for so many events... Um, I also decided I would start making uh, cocktails because we have an annual contest called Not Your Pink Drink Contest. I won it three years in a row and they said, hey, Heather, maybe you could just judge instead of enter. So I said, sure. And um, eventually they asked me to work on the board and be on the board for several years. I chaired the board for a year and then we had a need to really kind of develop a managing director role where we were moving from a smaller organization to something that was more robust, more mature. And so it's it's pretty much like an executive director role where I'm I'm basically managing, you know, how membership is going, how sponsorship going, how the event's looking. So I'm working with an entire team of people who are volunteers and staff to really pull together this idea and this this magic that is women and bourbon when you get them together in a room. That's awesome. You want to be here, don't you, Gina? I want to. I want to hang out with her. <laughs> you need to come hang out with the job. Me. I don't. I don't want another job, but I definitely want to hang out with her and go to and go to um, other places. Do you know what time it is? Uh, it's time for a trick. It is time for a trick, you little treat. And I'm gonna, <laughs> you little trollop. <laughs> so what you got? Well, let's go see. Yep. Salt in your cocktails. You know, it's super important these days, right? Everyone's talking about like salt, MSG, Himalayan pink salt, uh, Maldon salt, you know, cocktails calling for salt in there. So I'm just gonna help you along with this process, right? So let's just talk about it. You have salt, you have this pink salt, this is Himalayan pink salt. This is something that you usually cook with, right? Put it, put it in a grinder, it comes out in your hand. I don't know if you can see that really well, but it's like really, really small and flaky. You don't use the small flaky salt for your cocktails. This will make your drink extremely salty. Use this for your pasta. Now, pink salt in a flake form is fine. You need to get it a little bit more granulated and a little bit bigger. Now, when you're looking, someone calls for pink salt. It doesn't mean replace it with pink sprinkles. Do not use pink sprinkles in your cocktail. Do you wanna use this in your drink? Use it as a garnish, put it on the tray, serve your cocktails with it, stick it to the glass on one side, make it a party for sure. But substituting sugar for salt is not the same. What you're looking for is the flake salt. This is called a Maldon salt. And Maldon salt is really quite lovely. It's considered a pyramid salt. And I'm showing this to you because like if you say when a cocktail recipe calls for two flakes of salt, it's literally like one, two flakes of salt. And it's really quite special because not only are they look like a pyramid they're also crunchy and they provide a little bit of texture and they can make something that's um aperitif taste almost caramelly and they can bring in a lot of flavors in whiskeys as well as a plethora of other liquors and liqueurs so 
Use your salt wisely, and if you ever spill it, throw it over your shoulder. So who knew you were such a salty dog, Gina? <laughs> I mean, you know, I I really wanted to touch on the idea of salt because salt and bourbon and cocktails, just a little new, like a little, like the flake of salt that we talked about really can change a bourbon and a cocktail so much so. And I really think that it's like one of those things, but you got to be careful what you use. Yeah. And you really want to use a flake salt and you do not want to use like an iodized table salt or, or, or finely ground salt because it will become too salty. Yeah. It's not, you're not making soup. You're making a cocktail. <laughs> right. That, that would be a completely different cocktail. Well, no, it would be turkey brine yeah. and it would be Thanksgiving <laughs> and that would be a different episode. <laughs> So, but I'm fine. So, where are they going to go get that tips and tricks? You're going to go to Designated Drinker Dodge Show for the tips, tricks, how to, and the recipes. And you can catch me on Instagram at Designated Drinker and you can see it for yourself and see the different salts I'm showing. Um, so, you can um, put a face to the voice. There you go. So, to Gina's point, Designated Drinker Dodge Show <clears throat> will also get you to uh, Bourbon Women. We'll have live links there. So, you can, if you're ready to join, want to find out more, find out more. Easy for me to say. Um, and if that's too far for you to go, don't worry. Just scroll down through your episode notes and we'll have live links right there for you. Yeah. And then Heather will get you bottles of Pappy 23. Sure. That's what you get as your <laughs> uh, entry. Because <laughs> I just keep them. Um, I just have a set of them behind me on the bar. Yes, that's go. exactly the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> they just send those out when you join. They're like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for coming. So everyone knows, please note, Gina is a liar, liar, pants on fire. They will not send you that. <laughs> we do not have, no, 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 we do not. But, you know, if you all want to know the, um, if you all want to know the Bourbon Women channels, it's bourbonwomen.org is the website. And then all of our socials are at Bourbon Women. Yep, no worry. And if you didn't get it, doesn't matter. We'll have them live for you right in the episode notes. All right. This does bring us to the end of part one. Um, but don't worry. We've got more in store for you. If you like Gina and I, one round is never enough. Don't worry. We're going to tee up part two for you next week. So go ahead and top off that drink and get ready. Our second half of this episode and uh, with Heather and uh, come back and enjoy, enjoy some more boozy banter. And Gina's going to uh, whip up a fabulous Heather-inspired cocktail recipe that you don't want to miss. So cheers to that. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a Latino-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, we craft human connections through intelligent, engaging and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcast is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia led by skilled caregivers. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Links League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And while you're there, please don't forget to follow, download, and review the shows. Your reviews help our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.
All right, welcome back to part two of our conversation with designated drinker, Heather Wibbles, the managing director of Bourbon Women. So if you've missed part one, you know you need to go belly up back up. So if you've missed part one, go ahead and belly back up to that bar and give it a listen first. We will save a seat right here for you. So Heather, in part one, um, you shared what Bourbon Women is and you know some of the some of what it, it means to be the managing director. Um, and, but right now, you know what I'd really love to do is dive into your cocktail book. Can you uh, please tell us what we might find within the pages of, uh, and I have to tell you this, I love this title. Bourbon is my comfort food, the Bourbon Women Guide to Fantastic Cocktails at Home. I love that. I know, isn't it great? So, um, well, I, I would like to talk about my book at some point. Um, is that? Okay. Just checking to make sure, because. Yeah. <laughs> Diversifying in our symposium four-day conference, too, so that, too. Cool. August 24th through 27th. And tickets should go on sale in... Yeah, tickets should go on sale. Well, I shouldn't even say that to you all because I don't want to say something that doesn't happen. <laughs> we are doing it. I don't know the date the tickets are going to go on sale something yet. Something little like that. Yes, you need to go. You you need to cut. You, I will tell you guys, we had um, two women who do a podcast out of, one's in Arizona and the other one, she's in a different, she might be in a different state out west. And they came, one of them had never been before, and she lost her mind. She was like, this is the most fun ever. I'm never leaving. I was in the middle of the atrium of the hotel, and I hear, Heather, Heather. And I look up, and she's leaning over the, the railing. She's like, I'm here. It was just, it was too funny. You'd have a lot of fun. Yeah, did you all did you all want to give away a copy of the book? I can't remember. I talked about it with some, with some uh, one of the podcast people that um, I talked to. I didn't know if y'all. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, I'll send one to you. I've got some in the garage. Uh, I will need your in address, yeah, your address though, to send it to. Okay, thank you. you do as well I mean you help everyone understand the differences of the products that they're using and how things come together that's awesome <clears throat> so what Heather's not telling you is that she has access to so much good whiskey <laughs> so what it gets so what gets allocated to your state and like and her friends in and like where do you say we're and it Arizona? is a comfort food uh, her and, friends and it's Arizona, not just a comfort like, food to me I think for a lot of people who are bourbon lovers <laughs> The title kind of appeals Kentucky, to them because at the end of the long hard. day, you know, it's very likely that we're pouring ourselves, I don't know if you all can see this, a little Glencairn of bourbon or a cocktail um, to sip on at the end of the day. So the book is really came out of me winning that cocktail contest for three years in a row. I started doing um, cocktail content creation for bourbon women and then started working with other brands. And when the pandemic hit, um, I thought, well, I can't do my other job at the time was shut down. And I thought, well, I can't do that. Um, I'll just learn how to create and write and photograph uh, cocktails and put them on the internet. Um, I didn't really real, just something, you know, no big deal. I didn't realize it was one of the most difficult types of photography to learn because 
You have ice, which is reflective. You have glass, which is reflective. You have liquid, which is reflective. You've got loud, <laughs> light tell, bouncing all, right, all so over the place. Fact, right? um, and, but um, to me, it's right? kind of fun to learn like things that are tricky well and difficult and challenging. The, so the, um, that's where I started with putting together all of these cocktails. The and at about the 10th bottle, anniversary of Bourbon Women, which was going to be in 2021, let's see, is that right? Yeah, 2021, at our 10th anniversary, we wanted to do something special. So you know, um, two uh, people who are in the vodka. organization, Peggy and Stevens, our founder, and Susan Riegler, right? who was president for a so, long time, is a long time bourbon so authority, huge spirits I writer. Um, they said, we think you should write a book, Heather, um, with all your cocktails in it. And so I did what you do when Peggy and Susan tell you you should do something. I say, yes, sure. Exactly. I will do that right away. I no idea what it's going to entail. And so I put the book together. Whatever, right? But what I didn't so want I was just a book go, that was just a list of bourbon cocktails. To me, that's, that's not very DC, exciting. Like I got one There's a lot of those. So what I tried what? to do was, was develop like, ways goes, like, in what like, I call you know, cocktail labs in the book, trip, go, um, which are little experiments to do to help you develop your palate. So, for example, the chapter on olfactions really talks to you about how to use different bitters in an old-fashioned and what the bitters add to the flavors, how to match the bitters to the, the inherent flavors in the like, actual bourbon like or the tears, whiskey, so like, know you know, how to pull something out, out of the flavor when the nose might be really right well developed, but it's you don't just, really taste crazy. it as much. Like Sometimes you can use bitters for that. So, so it's really about helping you but, um, I've, um, discover well, your I've own cocktail and bourbon palette and using that to create your own bourbon cocktails. So what is, all right, here, here's a fun question. So... It's your last day on this planet. What's your last sip going to be? <laughs> yes. It's tough. That seems evil, Gina. It is evil, but it's so good. Because <laughs> like every bourbon person has a feeling and expression, and they have a bourbon for it, right? I wish I'm sure you do, right? Every motion, every party, everything has a feeling. So I want to know if it's your last sip. Well... No, 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 no. I and you don't, mm, mm, I will tell you that is actually not true. If I want to find stuff that's hard to find, like Blanton's, can't find it here. Like stuff that's really allocated. Everyone in Kentucky either knows someone who knows someone, or if it happens to get to a liquor barn or a retailer, a lot of people will just sell it to their friends and not even put it on the open market. So I have a better chance, actually, if I drive across the river to Indiana, of finding some of these things in these small liquor stores than I do of places in Kentucky. And that's, I get people from the organization or from other parts of the country messaging me all the time. Um, Cause I, I go by cocktail underscore Contessa, cocktailcontessa.com is my website. And so I'll have people reach out to me through that and they'll say, I'm coming to Kentucky, where can I find Blanton's? Or where can I find Weller? And I'm like, good luck. Cause I can't find it. You'll have more, <laughs> you're gonna have more. <laughs> Fast and far. <laughs> is that it, is is it, well? I like how she's all right, so all the distillery is listening to this. Yeah. She really did skate around that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly of the true. What are some of your goals, like, in your membership for 
Oh my god. Um. Ah. You know, you know else? You know what else should be included in this conversation, Gina? You're like literally. There's it's no asters in this room. You have nothing. That's like the to hardest question. Like, that's I, even I harder than what's your favorite whiskey? Because if it's favorite whiskey, I could say, well, let me tell you, oh, distillery by distillery. <laughs> you know what? I let me let me be honest. If it's my last day, as long as it was right, like a so hundred proof or over, I and I was sipping it with people I loved, game. it would be great. Before. Like. I think so, what's important with whiskey yeah, is the people that you share it with and the people that you drink it with. And that's why groups like Burke and Women are so much fun because so you have these relationships with these people who you otherwise wouldn't get to meet that have these radically different life experiences. And you have the most fun, engaging conversations with them because you're both interested in bourbon. So honestly, you know, I have, I don't think any of those bottles I will still have left at this, you know, hopefully when I die, I don't think I'll still have those bottles around. So we're, and I picked it up when I was in. But, uh, oh, I hope not. My God, my house is so flammable right now with all the alcohol I have in it. It's not even funny. We live in a wood house. And so the other day I was talking about my husband and I'm like, man, if our house catches on fire, we got to run fast because we put a lot of liquor in the house. Fast and far, like you grab the animals, I'll pop the window out. So, yeah. We were going to add a pinch or two pinches, I mean two cocktails, of flake salt. This is a Maldon salt. And... If you notice what's in there, it's dissolving pretty quickly. So obviously, this is a little bit, um, it's a little overproofed. Or really, well, a lot of strength, right? For 2023, so, we have, well, we have a lot in store. Last break, year um, was the first full year of our that. Bourbon Women Foundation, action, which is really designed to create and build some professional development programs to advance women in the industry and to really increase the diversity level. When I when I talk to you guys about um, wanting anybody who drinks whiskey in any way they want to be considered a whiskey drinker, to me, that opens the door to more diversity in the whiskey industry as consumers. And I think we need to also mirror that in terms of the people who are making it. From from my conversations with people across the industry, it is evident that consumers have a lot more joy and connection with the brand if they can see it being made by people who look like them and people who have the same life experiences as them. And so I think one of the things that the whiskey community and the bourbon community is really doing right now is understanding that getting that kind of diversity into the industry as consumers and as people who are making it is vital because bourbon brings community to it and when we need to make sure everybody has everybody has a chair at the table everybody has a place to sit everybody can see themselves in whiskey and it's something that our organization is really excited about um, just because we know there's a lot of growth and potential there bourbon and the bourbon is going to take on some of the new flavors and taste more of the woody tones which give you those characteristics that you're searching for the caramel the vanilla the cinnamon you know whatever flavor um that you get out of the bourbon and and i and i always say this if you're tasting a whiskey or tasting any spirit for that matter it's unique to you no one can tell you how you taste things you taste and experience it yourself so enjoy it and play with it. This is a really great recipe. So two and two. So if you don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the recipe on, on uh, designated during that show. All right. So it's a little bit warm in here. That was 45 rotations. My arm is tired. I know that, right? Okay. What do I always say? Make sure you chill the glass. Why would you spend all that time chilling a glass? I mean, chilling a drink and then pouring into a hot, into a hot glass. I need this. Oop. Okay. And now we're going to pour. Delicious. I I will drink this one, I think, maybe. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful color. Okay. So here comes the point where you can decide, do I want to put a cherry in this? Maybe. Right? I am definitely Yeah, I can't see anything. I, I just, I saw somebody walk by with a dog. <laughs> That's all I saw. White and then half of this. Let's go to Manhattan and ask. Yes. Just give it um, a little orange kiss, if you will. 
So one thing that's really lovely in this world is I couldn't really hear you. Oh, there's some background noise. Oranges, yeah. And if you don't agree with me, then whatever. Yes, I can. <laughs> um, <laughs> then you're wrong. Oranges, what this orange does, it just really brings out the fact that you have the chenar in there and that chocolate. So really what happens is that you really do start to um, taste that salty caramel. Uh, Bardstown so Bourbon Company had cheers. it through? Yes. Or Bar will it's Bardstown? in person someday. Oh. And congratulations on your book. Cheers. I think I like that one. Let's do something with that one. Oh so what are you going to make? Wait, what? Uh-huh. Oops. Oh no. Uh, oh, no. You can't spill a bourbon. Now you, have, now, you, now you have to throw it over your shoulder. <laughs> I'm going to do that outside. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite drinks. Did you, what do you think? Do you taste it? Do you say it's a caramel? Oh, it's so good. No, I, I, you know, and I'm not a bourbon drinker. That's not my go-to. And that is really beautiful. I like I love the the caramel, which is crazy. The fact that you said there isn't any, um, you know, I mean, I watched, you stood there and watched me drink. So I know there isn't. It's really lovely. And and you, so do and you all film this and, like, and show this as well, this or really do you just record this? So if it is hot out, throw it over an ice cube and let it, um, you know, let the water dilution ah, go okay. again. You're, you, have a, you have a high proof spirit. <laughs> you, know, you can throw, you know, a little bit of water is going to do it a little bit of good. And then, you know, you can always adapt these into large pitcher style, like style drinks. If you're going to have a dinner party or something to start um, to end the evening with. Well, yeah, I don't know if it's. Cool. Ah, so I, for all right, so Gina, I did a um, solution is awesome. Uh, I totally a love dinner that. party and at my house where we had three different black Manhattans. One of them had a Varna, one of them had right? Chinar, what I and the other one like had Montenegro. Like solution, and so when you said you were going to have Chinar to it, I'm like, water it's going to be good. <laughs> and I did not, and to be quite honest with you, I did not have access to distilled water to do that, but I kind of would have done that. But then that's a whole chemistry thing. I feel like for people at home, you're more inclined to take the um like the nice mold on salt and put a couple of flakes in your drink than you are um to make the saline solution so this is more for an at home you know you know I, I'm, I'm with my at home bartenders i'm like let's do this you know and i love my industry peeps um and if you do want to get mess around with saline solution 100% get yourself distilled water and you do it with that don't try to do it with your top water i don't care where you live if you live off of a well well, water's pretty good, but the problem is, is that your salt content is going to be higher because that's how you purify your water. So it's very interesting. But I will say this to all the people that do live off of a well. Don't put any salt in your water because a bourbon in water off of people that live off of a well is always better than any other water. It's so delicious. Like it is just a pure water source. Like as long as you know your water is good to drink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it's wild <laughs> i will say that i do i'm telling you kentucky's great i love i love that you went to when i went there um with they get their water right out of the like like will it just for example gets their water literally from the um not the it's not a creek it's a um um, um, um a spring the spring right outside of the distillery it's it's great you can look at it it's amazing it's beautiful they are very careful with it it's wonderful i think rowan's creek runs into their property as well and like you know you see all these different um names of uh whiskeys and you're like oh where's all this coming from it's coming from a lot of them is coming from there yes i'm sure that maker's marks using um you know tap water i have no idea i still love maker's mark this is not against it i big fan my husband has tattoos of maker's mark we love it <laughs> we're a maker's mark family for sure I did not. I'm not allowed to go there without my husband. He was um, very adamant that I could not go there and have a better experience than he has. 
So um, we, I'm very fortunate to have gone and got treated very well at all the distilleries. <laughs> and, um, and also, for people that are listening to this podcast in Louisville, I love Third Street Dive oh Bar. Oh, my God. It's the greatest bar. <laughs> Only second to last call. Only second. I love that bar, though. What a great bar. You guys have a great, great neighborhood bar there. Such a good time. So, um, anyway, let's I'm do done. Sorry, sorry. No, no. You, you, you're up. Where's our help? We gotta do our housekeeping. Where are we gonna go get that cocktail? So, if you want our recipes or how to's, you're gonna go to Designated Drinker Not Show. If you need a link, how to get to um, Heather and to Bourbon Women, Heather's book. You should get the book. That's a good. That's a great idea. And then I believe that Heather's going to tell you about something that's coming up in the summer. Yeah. yeah. What do you have coming up? And uh, we will be. We'll, it'll be all wrong if we miss it. What's coming up with Bourbon Women in October? No, September. To August. Oh, in August. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sorry. But well, you at least have to taste it and tell me how it is. Wow. We're going to have to. Thank you. Cheers, cheers. No worries. Absolutely. The creative director. What you don't know is that I actually poured a little bit of a Bardstown Bourbon Company um, rye just to have a glass to sip on. Yeah. Your demographic was your target audience would be female, even if and especially if it were a man's product, because men buy what their wives or their women in their lives tell them to buy so even you know it, it could be you name it men's did you lose your drink deodorant a men's drug all of them it's always been um your your demographic is female which when they talk about diversify i mean women make up less than we're probably at like four percent of all creative directors in the world in your ad agencies so we are, i would have men tell me women don't think that way yeah yeah. Victoria's Secret's a good example of that bullshit, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And thank you, Taylor Swift, for making it known that he was a man. <laughs> now, will Taylor Swift be at the conference? <laughs> Handing. No, do not do that. Oh, do not. <laughs> You're going to make you have a heart attack if you do that. I'm, I'm loving that. So, before so Gina, how come you, you used how come you used flake salt instead of saline solution? Ask 
one question for our listeners, and you almost, you basically just stated it, but I want everyone to be sure and hear it from you directly that you do not need to be a master uh, and have a great understanding of bourbon. It's merely the curiosity. This is an organization meant for all levels of interest mm. and yeah. passion behind for bourbon. Correct? all you okay so you know in uh in, in modern times do you like that i changed <laughs> yeah, it like that. Not very serious in like modern that. times people identify themselves with all kinds of spirit animals <laughs> and you might identify yourself with the great state of kentucky's cardinal well and you might be like i we're pretty lucky and fiercely in loyal Louisville, actually because so many distilleries are here the tap water whiskey. is actually what they use but to proof down a right lot of the whiskey and, so well no she'd be a probably female, my so tap water is fine i know tan. when i go other places i can Only definitely the taste the water and i can definitely the taste the women, salt that you're talking about the women are cute <laughs> all right this anyway all you. <laughs> anyway anyway on that note um if you can identify yourself with a spirit ingredient now that could be uh an ingredient for cocktails or an ingredient for food but one ingredient that identifies like that you identify with and like a and spring w- what does it say about you Could be, could be, it could be um, a spe- like your spirit ingredient. Like it could be for food or drink. It doesn't matter. Something that like just like you, I, you could be like lemon. It's just is everything for me. <laughs> what is your what is your last? <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to Maker's Mark when you were here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's cool. Mm. Well, it's actually in August. Yes. I like it. Yeah. I like it. No, that's okay. Um, So in August, we have our Um, national conference, which is a combination of an industry conference, a whiskey conference, a girls weekend, and a family reunion. It is, you know, almost, I have probably more than 400 people this year, 400, (laughs) mostly women, uh, come to Louisville, Kentucky, and we start on (laughs) Thursday with special excursions (laughs) and VIP experiences. Uh, end up with excursions uh, and fun workshops, cheers. keynotes from top Thanks speakers in the industry on Friday and on Saturday. And on Sunday, some people aren't finished. And so they, quite frankly, will get up, have breakfast, yes. and go out to some more distillery excursions on Sunday morning. And then scattered throughout the weekend, we have these specialty events like in a bourbon house dinners where that are hosted by some of the the, the big wigs in the bourbon industry, like Peggy No Stevens and Susan Ringler. Um, and we have all kinds of specialty events so that people can really dive deep. It's it's an entire four day uh, four days of bourbon fun. And it is something that 
I, I've been to every single one. I love it. I'm helping run it now as managing director. And it is so much fun to put together unique workshops and partner with these distilleries. We had 45 sponsors, I think, last year helping make that happen. It's, yeah, it's incredible. The support from the bourbon industry is really, it really speaks to their, um, their support, not just of women, but to expanding their consumer base, because I think they realize that, you know, women make, do do, do you all know this fact that women make or directly influence, I think, 80% of all consumer spending? (laughs) Well, we, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but really, mm, well, we haven't contacted her yet. So if you have connections to her PR agency, well, then maybe now, but we really, yeah, but we, we really, um, we pulled together some top speakers in the industry. We had uh, Marianne Eves come in last year, and we had Jackie Zykin come in. Those of you who are bourbon geeks will know exactly who those two women are. Um, we have authors come in, podcasters come in, like I was telling you guys. So it's it's a really fun weekend because you are sitting at a table and you're talking to a woman and asking her, you know, where she's from. And you find out she's the master distiller of a small craft distillery. And she would just love to host you, you know, if you stop by her distillery. It's it's just, it's unpretentious. It's fun. It is authentic connections. And I will stop talking about it now because I could talk about it for hours. It's so much fun. And you got to come. You guys both need to come. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. We have people who just had a glass and thought it sounded like a cool idea come to events. And they're like, I love the bourbon, but I love the women too. It's just a fun group to hang out with. And we have people, we do have people who are master distillers and master blenders who are members and and longtime supporters. And I think they love as much as we do connecting with the women who are enjoying with their products. Right, because you want to see yourself in the whiskey that you make, in the bourbon that you make. You want to see people like you enjoying it. I think they get as much from coming to the event, whether they're supporting it or speaking or you know providing spirits for it as a sponsor. I think they get as much as the women do who get to meet them and interact with them.
So one, so I make sure I understand. You mean one cocktail ingredient or one type of bourbon or? Why do you have to ask such hard questions? <laughs> okay, so. Don't you dare. Don't you even dare ask that question, Gina. <laughs> What's the last bite of food before you pass? No. Um, I I would say, <laughs> so the first thing that came to mind when you said that is an Amaro with really chocolatey tones because I love chocolate, but I love things that are really bitter. And I always joke that, you know, when I drink a, a black Manhattan that it's dark like my soul, you know? And so, <laughs> and so I think one of the, one of the things I love about uh, Amari in general, especially combined with bourbon is that with something with that much bitterness can really pull out real specific uh, flavor notes from the bourbon that might be hidden otherwise. Um, but I particularly like Amari that have chocolate and coffee undertones in them. They, those are my favorite. And if there aren't, there, if there isn't enough in there, you don't really need to, but sometimes I'll add coffee or chocolate bitters to it. So yours would be lemon? Oh. And, and yeah, and vibrantly red. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for having me.